being at evening Sunday school class. And as you can tell, uh, I don't uh, know that how many got the memo that, uh, that we had moved Sunday school to 5 p.m. on Sunday, and hopefully this will be just temporary, uh, but uh, we'll wait and see. We're going to sing a song to get us started, hymn 285, hymn 285 in your hymn book, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. If you can stand with me, let's stand together. I think we sing better while we're standing. Sing with me on that first verse. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. Just stepped in, hymn 285. Grab your hymn book. Join us on that second verse together now. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. Lord, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, what have I to dread now? What have I to dread? What am I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning. Secure from all alarm, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. You did a good job. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, though times are very different right now, and for us to be here at five o'clock and, and uh, in a Sunday school class seems a little unusual, but uh, we're grateful that we can take time out. Uh, and a little bit more on a, on a casual basis, Lord, be able to study the Bible. And we pray that the truth that will be presented this afternoon would be one, Father, that we would embrace and realize just how wonderful and a merciful God we have. We pray, Father, that tonight that you would bless every class across the property, whether it be a children's class, a teen class, the singles, married couples, wherever they may be meeting this evening, that you would bless them and may we learn and teach the Word of God. Now, Father, again, thank you for this morning, for the people that were saved, the people that were baptized, and we thank you, Father, for sending visitors as well uh, this morning, and we're grateful for the outcome of our, uh, our summer track program and all the, the folks that have uh, been passing tracks out, the response to that, and we'll give you the glory and the praise now for it in Christ's name. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you for being here at our first uh, Sunday afternoon uh, Sunday school class and Bible study. I do want to draw a couple of things to your attention so that you can begin to spread the word. Uh, we will be having uh, our vacation Bible school. It begins a week from tomorrow. Now, we're going to do things a little bit different this year uh, with the kids to try to stay uh, in line with all the regulations. Uh, in talking with our city officials and the health folks, they said, look, we're not against, we want you to have VBS, but they put so many restrictions if we had it inside that it was almost not even worth having it because you couldn't have but about 30 or 40 kids total uh, in there with all the distancing and things we had to do. But they said, but if you have it outside, it's a whole different story. And so they recommended that we have it outside. So we took them up on their recommendation. So what we're going to do this year is we're going to put the big top tent up out here. And the VBS will be underneath the tent outside. Uh, you say, preacher, it's going to be warm. Well, we've got some things working, hopefully, to relieve a little bit of the heat uh, inside there. But it's Texas in the summer, folks. That's just the way we live. And uh, so I hope that you will encourage uh, folks to, uh, to come. Maybe you know some 
uh, couples that have children that are in that uh, sixth grade and down range to four years old. So th those, that's going to be one of the things that's going to be different. Secondly, the, the next thing that's going to be different is the time. Instead of going from, from 6 to 9, we're going to go from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Uh, Brother Kagan uh, is going to run the whole program this year. And so he'll have all the programs. There will be some crafts that will be going on on Tuesday and Thursday. I think the kids will enjoy that. But other than that, Brother Kagan will run the whole show uh, this year. Uh, so we won't have the breakout teaching classes like we did. That's the reason many of you think, well, preacher, this is the first I heard of it. I know. And uh, the reason being is because the personnel that we need to run the VBS this year, uh, we, don't, we don't need 50 people because we don't have teachers. We don't need helpers uh, in, those, in that capacity. And uh, so what we did is we asked a few people that were able to take the time to help us uh, in a few different areas. So that's the reason. Now, if you want to come and be a part, that's up to you. Uh, but uh, there, uh, the, these are the, some of the things that will be different. Uh, everybody that enters the tent will have their temperature taken. Doesn't matter whether you're an adult or a young person. Everybody's temperature will be taken. There will be one entry to the tent. There will be one exit to the tent. And uh, so just so that you kind of know how... Uh, things are going to operate uh, there. So we'll be the tent will be set up just kind of like it, it is on Friend Day behind the two-story building, and that's where we'll have everything set up uh, there. And all the kids will be seated. All the girls that are uh, in that uh, that pre-K, uh, that four and five, they'll sit together. All the boys, same thing. And we'll do that in 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 two age groups: four to five, six to seven, eight to ten, and eleven. Uh, to 12, I think, is, uh, is the way it's set up. So there'll be kind of eight pockets of kids that will be in the, under the tent, and uh, there'll be a, a scaffolding platform that'll be made. Uh, the, the, the folks the, uh, that built the big platform, remember when we had the drive-in services? They'll, they'll put the, the, uh, the platform together to be about three foot tall, uh, and uh, it's going to be decorated and things. So we're going to do the best that we can. I think we'll have a good time. Uh, if, uh, if we focus on the heat, you're not going to have a good time, right? So you've got to focus on the program. And that's why uh, we're doing it that way. Really, uh, uh, class, the only other option that we had was not to have anything at all, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to rob our kids from uh, having a VBS if we could at all put one together in which the ladies and the staff and I have been planning this now for, my goodness, probably six to eight weeks, somewhere in that vicinity, and everything's coming together. So I wanted you to know kind of how it was going to operate. So if you have kids or grandkids that you would like to participate in the Vacation Bible School, it will begin at 6.30 instead of 6, and it will end at 8 instead of 9 o'clock. Now, you say, well, preacher, that's not a very, why end at 8? Well, first of all, if I'm going to have it under the tent, I don't want to have to put lighting out there. And so it's, pretty, it's still pretty light at 8 o'clock. So everything will be done in the daylight. And so that's one of the reasons that we're going, that we're going to cap it at 8 o'clock. So uh, be in prayer for Brother Mrs. Kagan. They'll be driving down a week from tomorrow, and I know we'll have a good time. Also, I'll be announcing in the church service that uh, we want to try now to try to keep, we, we use this first week of our 7-Eleven uh, track club to kind of gauge uh, how many tracks people were giving out and, and uh, how many people that volunteered were going to participate and we've almost had 100% participation. Uh, you say, well, preacher, I, didn't, I wasn't able to give my tracks. Then give them out this week along with your other seven. But you need to pick up your new packet uh, uh, tonight before you leave because tomorrow starts a new week and, and, and we start to passing those tracks out as well. But each one that if you volunteered to pass out a packet of tracks, you have been assigned to one of the male staff members. If you have not already been contacted by that staff member so that you'll know what, what staff member that you've been assigned to, uh, then uh, <clears throat> notify the office. Mrs. Ingram will let you know we have a list of everybody that volunteered and who the staff member is that you've been assigned to. Now, the reason we assigned you to a staff member was because we want to keep up with how many tracks are being passed out. And, uh, and then what we're, our plan is, is next Sunday night, is to, to have a slide up here to show you how many, how many people uh, are participating and then how many tracks are being passed out and how many people are being saved. So we want to track that. So if, you, uh, if your staff member has not contacted you either by text, an email, a phone call, or some way, 
uh, then call the office. Mrs. Ingram will let you know who the staff member is that you've been assigned to. And then all we need you to do <clears throat> is, is when you pass your seven tracks out, just text them and let them know, hey, done. If you just, listen, if you, if you just say, hey, this is Brother Havens, done. They, they, they understand what you mean. Uh, that way that we, we can kind of keep up with how many tracks that we're actually passing out. And the reason we're doing that, folks, is because if uh, we ordered 10,000 tracks, if everybody that, that volunteered passes out all the tracks, that's over 12,000 tracks. So we'll have to reorder some tracks. So we need to kind of keep up with it so we kind of know if we're going to need to reorder uh, tracks uh, by those that are participating. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you would, and then of course be in prayer for Vacation Bible School, and then right after that, a couple of weeks down the road from that, is our National Youth Conference. Now I say national because our youth conference is almost the only game in town as far as a youth conference is concerned. We've got a church coming from California. We got one coming from Colorado. We just had a church from Illinois register because most churches have canceled their conferences. And uh, because of the openness that, we're, that we have the liberty to here in Texas, we, we're able to have our youth conference uh, and, and be able to fill the, uh, seat the people properly in the auditorium, groups sitting together. And uh, so we're going to have a good time there. Pray for that if you would please, okay? Well, listen, thank you so much for being here. I almost said this morning, but uh, this evening. Let's start off with a word of prayer. And I want you to open your Bible up, if you would please, uh, over to the book of Numbers. Numbers. Now you're going to need your Bible handy because we're going to run a lot of references for the lesson uh, this evening. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. And then we're going to run some references in the book of Psalms here in just a moment. Let's start with prayer. Father, uh, over the next 30 minutes or so, uh, boy, we sure would like to learn from the Bible. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, uh, certainly take the subject matter that uh, at hand and uh, that we might learn more and more about this particular characteristic, which in this preacher's perspective is one of your greatest characteristics that you exhibit to mankind every day of our life. The Father, this evening, uh, we're grateful for the classes, for the people that are here. We pray now that as the study goes forth that, uh, Lord, we'd be able to uh, connect with this truth. And Holy Spirit, please, please, please teach us. Embed it into our hearts now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Numbers chapter 14 is where we're going to be, and I want you to look at verse number 18, Numbers 14 and verse number 18. The Bible says, the Lord is long-suffering. Somebody ought to give a witness right there. The Lord is long-suffering, and not just is he a God of mercy, it says of great mercy. Forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the, listen to this now, the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Now there's two things I want you to notice about these passages. Not only did Moses, the writer of the book of Numbers, express in verse 18 that we serve a God of great mercy, but then also in verse number 19, he says that when God displays this mercy, it is the greatness of his mercy that we get to experience. And I would probably say that everyone here this evening at, uh, if you have not experienced the mercy of God today, uh, hopefully you will. Because everything about our God and, and, and his character, uh, just it, it, it reeks with mercy on this generation and, of course, on mankind. Now, take your Bible, go to Psalm 31. I just want a couple of other verses uh, here. I want to speak to you this afternoon on the subject, the marvel of God's mercy. The marvel of God's mercy. All right, Psalm chapter 31 and verse number seven. The psalmist says, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble, thou hast known my soul in adversities. Now, I'm going to read you a couple of other passages from the book of Psalms because it's important that we understand that mercy, the mercy of God, is displayed in two different facets 
toward mankind. And we'll look at those in just a moment. Psalm 62 and verse number 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. For thou renderest to every man according to his work. Psalm 86, 5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. Listen, and plenteous in mercy. And to, unto all them that call upon thee. And then Psalm 103 and verse number 8, the Bible says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. So we're going to talk for just a few moments now about the marvel of God's mercy. I want to say a couple of things kind of to introduce the lesson, and then we'll get some, to some things you can jot down. You know, when we get to heaven, one of the things that we may be praising God for all eternity. You say, we're gonna, I'm going to praise God for his holiness. Yes, we will. I'm going to praise God for his righteousness. Yes, we will. I'm going to praise God for his goodness and long suffering. And yes, we will. But let me tell you something, dear friend, this, this afternoon, if I say this morning, just nod your head. It's okay. But one of the things I think that we're going to praise God for is his great mercy Amen. that he's had upon mankind and upon you and I. Think about this, class. What right will we have to even be in the presence of the God, of a God of glory, if it was not for his mercy? What right would we even have to be there? Did we not, as lost sinners, participate in the rebellion which sought to dethrone the king of glory? By the way, the Bible says that at one time we were the children of the devil, our father the devil. We were children of disobedience. We were part of the push by the devil to overthrow the throne of God. We were part of that, being a child of the devil. Did we not participate in that? Did we not walk in times past class according to the course of this world and the prince of the power of the air? As well as, did we not walk in the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience? That's where we were one day. We, weren't, we had no, uh, no claim to glory. Think of this class. Did we not once live in the lust of the flesh? And were we not by nature the children of wrath, according to Ephesians 2, verses 2 and 3? Once, the Bible says, we were alienated and enemies in our mind by our wicked works. Col Colossians chapter 1 and verse 21. You say, preacher, you're not painting a very picture, a very pretty picture of man's condition. That's where mercy is going to come in and mean so much more to us because God, out of his goodness and his long suffering, extended to us mercy. You say, but preacher, we've been reconciled to God. Yes, we have. We've earned eternal Separate, we, we Listen, the one thing because of his mercy, we have not earned eternal separation. We could have been separated from God forever. What God has given us is he's given us communion instead of separation. We deserved hell, but he gave us heaven. That's mercy in our lives. All because of the tender mercy of God. But I do want to say this, class. Mercy has always been and will always continue to be one of God's strongest attributes ever extended to mankind. And it's been that way since the beginning of time. God had mercy on Adam and Eve. God had mercy on Cain, even though he could have squashed Cain out of existence. You see, the mercy of God has, has, has been in existence and part of his being. Class, God's mercy to the lost of this world is on display every day. And the reason we know it's on display every day is because they're not destroyed. If God wanted to destroy the lost, he could destroy the lost. But because of his great mercy, because of his plenteous mercy, the lost are still alive. Why? Because the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering is one of the offshoots of mercy. Long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I mentioned to you just a moment ago that mercy is displayed in the Bible by God in two different facets. And I want you to write these down. I'm going to give you a definition of mercy, and it's just going to be very simple. Here's what mercy is mercy expresses itself in Scripture 
in one of two ways. Here are the two ways I want you to write down. First of all, mercy is God withholding judgment upon us, although it's deserved. Okay, let me, let me say that again. Mercy, when you find God presenting mercy in the Bible, he will present it in the, in the facet of withholding judgment upon those although it is deserved. So if you look at it, God is withholding judgment upon us, although it's deserved. We deserve hell, but he gave us heaven. That's mercy. We, that's what we deserve, but he gave us the complete opposite of that in Christ. But here's the second thing that you'll find in the Bible when God shows mercy. God, uh, as far as how he expresses it, not only is it withholding judgment upon those that deserve it, but the second facet is this, God healing or comforting the suffering. For instance, do you remember Bartimaeus? Do you remember as Jesus was passing that day, Bartimaeus cried out and said, Thou son of David, have mercy. That's the facet of mercy that he was calling for. He was saying, have comfort, have healing uh, upon my suffering, upon my blindness. So mercy can be characterized as God's compassion on those in distress, either way. So the first one, the first facet we find in the Bible, when God displays his mercy, is he withholds judgment upon us, although it's deserved, and then we'll find that God uses healing and comforting and extends that to the suffering as he did with Bartimaeus, okay? Now, God's mercy to the saved of this world is boundless and free, amen? The mercy of God that we receive on a continual basis because of who we are in Jesus Christ, it is available to us not just right now, but in every situation. That's the reason we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And what does the Bible tell us that we can find there? Mercy and grace and help in time of what? In time of need. It is something that God extends to the born-again believer. Now, with that said, I want you to jot some things down for the lesson this evening about, some, about uh, the things that we need to know about the mercy of God. Take your Bible, go to Genesis chapter 19. Let me show you something interesting about the mercy of God. Remember, God tells us that he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and compassion on whom he will have compassion. All right, now I want you to show, I want you to look at something here in Genesis 19. Okay, Genesis 19. And here's the first thing I want you to jot down about the marvelous mercy of God. The first thing I want to note this evening is this. God's mercy can be applied by him Okay, follow this. God's mercy can be applied by him without an appeal from the one who is the recipient of it. Okay, are you, are you, did you follow that? So in, when, when God extends mercy, God can extend mercy on whom he extends mercy. So in other words, mercy can be applied without an actual appeal from the one who is the recipient. Genesis 19, y'all know where I'm going with this? Okay, remember Lot? Lot's in Sodom. Should he have been there? No, he did not. Did he destroy his family by being there? Yes, he was. Completely out of the will of God by being there. Remember, the angels of the Lord appeared to Abraham. Remember, Abraham talked them down to 10. If there be 10 righteous in the city, would you spare it? God said, well, that's where it all stopped. Listen, folks, there wasn't even 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was only four. Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. He was out of God's will. And listen, he was enjoying the wealth of the city. And here's what he did. Lot put himself in a precarious situation that destroyed his family. And he was willing to tolerate the, the immorality that was going on in that city for the sake of having wealth. Remember, Lot was all about himself and all about things. That's the reason he chose the well-watered plains of Sodom and sent his uncle, an old man, out into the desert. 
And so he had no consideration of Abraham. Now, if we were in the situation, we would just let, God, let Lot rot there, right? But the Bible says that God is a God of great mercy. Here was a believer in a place that he should not have been. Let me ask you a question. Was Lot asking for mercy? Was not. Now let's look at Genesis 19, 19. Okay? Now this is the conversation going on because remember when the angels told Lot, get your family, get out, don't look back. Remember he's trying to negotiate with them? about, well, like we can't go to the mountains. There's wild beasts up in the mountains. You know, we can't survive there. Let me go to this city. Let me go here. So he's negotiating. But I want you to notice something here that he did recognize in verse 19. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Look at this. And thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. Let me ask you a question again. Did he ask to be saved? He did not. Did he ask God to deliver him? He did not. God extended Lot, by the way, who didn't deserve this, but God extended mercy to Lot, even though he didn't deserve it, and pulled him out of Sodom before the destruction, and he never asked for it. God just extended it to him. Now listen, don't miss this, it's important. He extended it to him because he was a child of God. Amen. That's why he extended it to him. And class, how many times have you and I been extended mercy by God and you never asked for it? God delivered you out of a situation you didn't even know you were going to get yourself in one day and God delivered you out of it and you said, oh, thank God, thank you, Lord, for having mercy, uh, even though I didn't ask for it. And so God can um, can extend mercy and he can apply that mercy without an appeal from the one who is the recipient. So here is uh, Lot being delivered from uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and he, uh, he acknowledged that, that God had magnified his mercy toward him. He didn't deserve God's mercy, but he was a recipient of it and he never even made an appeal for it. He got it because he was a child of God. Here's the second thing I want you to jot down. God's mercy is not a temporary mood that he gets in. Okay, can I say that again? Mercy is not a temporary mood, but an attribute of his eternal being. It's who he is. Take your Bible quickly. You'll recognize a couple of these verses. Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Look in Psalm 100 and verse number 5. Psalm 100 and verse number 5. Okay, Psalm 100 and verse 5. See if you recognize this. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. So God's mercy is not a temporary mood that God gets in and says, well, you know what, um, I'm going to go ahead and extend mercy to Brother Phillips today, but you know what, but I may not extend it tomorrow. It's not a mood that God gets in. It's an attribute. It's who he is. It's how he uh, exhibits that goodness to us. Look at Psalm 103 and verse 17. Turn the page. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. So the point I want to make there is since God has no beginning, don't miss this class, then mercy never began. It's always been a part of God. Everybody see that? Mercy never had a beginning because it's always been a part of God and God had no beginning. And because it's an attribute of God, mercy never began to be, but from eternity always was. So mercy will never cease to be. See if you recognize Psalm 107 and verse number one. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth, how long, class? Forever. Why? Because mercy didn't come into being. It's always been because God has always been. So God's mercy is not a temporary mood that he gets in, but it's an attribute of his eternal being. Now think of this class. Mercy can never be more or less 
since it is infinite in itself. And infinite can never suffer reduction. Okay, so if you tap into God's mercy today, God's not, listen, it's not like a gas gauge that goes down every time it's used. It, it endureth forever. Why? Because it's part of his being. So although God is constantly exercising mercy to the saved every day, he is never reduced in ability nor quantity, listen, or quality of the mercy that he shows. To think that God only has so much mercy to go around, listen now, is to insult his sovereignty. Amen. To think that God only has a little mercy to go around and that every time God's people tap into it, it's like a gas gauge and it goes whoop, whoop, and it starts going toward empty. That's an insult to God's sovereignty to even think that he would run low on mercy. All right, here's thought number three, quickly. God's mercy is an inexhaustible, that's a big word, inexhaustible. So God's mercy is an inexhaustible divine attribute, now don't miss this, this is good stuff now, that disposes him to be actively compassionate. Did you know that compassion is one of the offshoots of mercy? Think of this class, whenever and wherever God shows up in the Bible, when he shows up before men, the wonderful thing is he just simply acts like himself. He never, he, God never has to adjust himself to a situation. When he showed up, Bartimaeus, he just acted like God and healed him. When he showed up before a leper, he just acted like himself and healed him. You'll find that every place in the Bible. Let me show you something. Go to Psalm 86. Psalm 86. And look at verse number 15. Now, I said God's mercy is an inexhaustible divine attribute that disposes or it pushes him, it causes him to be actively compassionate. And he'll, he, he is active whenever and wherever he shows up. Psalm 86, verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, oh, here it is again, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Isn't it amazing how where most of the places that you'll find mercy in the Bible, you'll also find the word long-suffering or you'll find the word compassionate there. Remember in the Bible, we're giving the, we're giving the story of the Good Samaritan. I think we all understand that that story is symbolic of Jesus Christ reaching out to those in time of need where you had two religious people pass by on the other side, a Samaritan came by who should have spit on that beat up Jew that's laying down there, should never have gone to them because the Jews and the Samaritans were on completely opposite ends of the spectrum. But yet the Samaritan went to him, bound up his wounds, put him on his own beast and carried him into town. That's a picture of the mercy of Almighty God. And so we're given these illustrations like this because God's mercy is an inexhaustible divine attribute that disposes him to be actively compassionate. Wonderful, wonderful truth. God never has to adjust, class, his character to accommodate any situation. He just appears, he speaks, and his personal attributes, listen, immediately apply to every situation. He doesn't have to adjust. Why? Because it's who he is. Listen, when he was in the Garden of Eden, look at the compassion and mercy that he had upon Adam and Eve. Listen, there were only two people. If it were you and I, if there's only two people, let's just destroy them and start over. It's not that, it's not that big a deal, right? You just turn them back into dust and you start over again. But God didn't do that. Why? Because of who he is. He's plenteous in mercy. And he extended mercy to them. He provided skins for clothing. Again, may I remind you, in the Garden of Gethsemane, on display again, the mercy and compassion of God. At this time, to a betrayer. 
where Jesus was in the garden and here comes Judas leading the guards from the temple and leading the Roman guards there to make sure the arrest was done sufficiently. And Jesus looked at him. Judas comes and kisses him. And Jesus looked at him and said, friend. You know what that is? That's called mercy. And mercy and compassion go together. Compassion may be the strongest element within the mercy of God. Here's number four. Jot it down real quick. Number four about mercy. Mercy is God's goodness confronting human suffering and guilt. Mercy is God's goodness confronting human suffering and guilt. Go, if you would, to Numbers 21. Go back to Numbers 21. You'll recognize this particular section of Scripture, number, Numbers 21, and beginning in verse number 6. Now remember, Israel refused to go into the promised land, so as they're wandering in the wilderness, they still had, they were stiff-necked, rebellious, and so God gets their attention in verse number 6, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now, if it stopped right there, most of us would say, well, they got what they deserve, right? I mean, they were stiff-necked, they were rebellious, they basically spit in God's face. For the last time, God's tired of it. He sent fiery serpents, biting them, and a bunch of them died. But wait a minute, it doesn't stop there. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Now listen, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. You know what we just read there? We read the mercy and compassion of God. You see, the mercy of God's goodness is it confronts human suffering. And boy, you can't get more suffering than being bit by fiery serpents with the potential of dying. And God says, okay, I'm going to put a serpent, a, a brazen serpent up on a pole and just hold it up. And if you look on the serpent, when you get bit, you live. I wonder what happened to how many people, the people that got bit and didn't, didn't look. They died. Why? Because they refused to accept the mercy of God. And folks, how many times do people find themselves in a situation in life and they think it's so bad and they've done so many rotten things that they refuse to acknowledge the mercy of God and yet God says, I don't understand why you would refuse it. It's who I am. I am a father. You're my child. I'm going to extend mercy to you. Remember, it's God withholding judgment upon all, although it's deserved. And so God's mercy is good, his goodness confronting human suffering and guilt. Go to Psalm 51. Go to Psalm 51. Okay, let's look at another situation. David finds himself having committed adultery and he is absolutely in the depths of guilt. You ever been there? In the depths of guilt? And here's a man, the king of Israel, the most powerful figure in the world at that time, and boy, he made a mammoth, committed a mammoth sin. And it was, David, I think, felt that it was probably just right there uh, at the point to where he just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what God's going to do. I mean, I've just, I, I've committed the ultimate horrible sin of adultery. And notice what he says in verse 51. Have mercy upon me, O God. You know what he's doing? He's calling out for God to withhold judgment even though he deserves it. He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude, uh-oh, look at this now, of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. So now here we have a man that makes an appeal for mercy. Let me give you a couple of more. You can study them on your own. John chapter 4, Jesus shows up in Samaria at a well. Here comes a woman to the well to get some water. They have the conversation. Remember, he said, look, you came here to get physical water. I have water you need. And if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And she said, oh, Lord, give me this water. And she thought he was going to pull out a vial of holy water or something. He was talking about himself. 
And during the conversation, remember what he found out about her? He found out that she'd been married five times and the man she was living was even her husband. Now the thing about it is she gets saved. She runs back into the city and tells the people in the city. Do you all remember what she tells them? She said, come and see a man that told me all things that I've ever done. Wait a minute. Did Jesus tell her everything that she had ever done? No, he did not. But he told her enough of what she had done that she knew that he could tell her everything that she had ever done. And so she realized that. You know what God showed that day to an adulterous woman? And listen, I don't know how that, how, why that fits into the story necessarily uh, and why the Lord brought that to light. I think it was to help us to see that there's no sin and there's no situation that the mercy of God can't cure and can't fix. She had been married five times and she was living with a guy. Remember John chapter 8, a woman called in adultery? They threw her down at Jesus' feet to see what he would say. They said, hey, this woman was caught in, in the act of adultery. And basically what they were saying, you know, here's what Moses said, that she's to be stoned, what do you say? They were trying to catch him in, all, in, 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 in some uh, discrepancy to the law. Jesus takes his finger and writes in the sand. He said, what did he write? I don't know, but I have a sneaky suspicion that if we're going to stick to the letter of the law, then go get the man. Where's the guy? Okay, I think personally, when we get to heaven, we'll find out personally, I think she was set up. I think she was set up for the very purpose because, by the way, why did, where did they go find her in the very act if they, hadn't, if they didn't set her up? So I think they set her up only to bring her to Jesus to see what he would do. And I think when he bent down and wrote in the sand, I think he wrote something to the effect that, okay, that's great. I know the laws of Moses. They're both to be stoned. Where's the man? So here she is face down and Jesus spake, and I'm paraphrasing. He looked at those Pharisees and said, okay, ye who are without sin, cast the first stone. Not a one of those religious Pharisees, listen, had the guts to stand behind what they did. They were cowards. They weren't even willing to stand behind what they said that they believed. Now, if they would call her an act of adultery, they knew that they needed the man. They didn't have the man. Why? Because they set her up. And they couldn't bring themselves to be hypocrites. So they dropped their stones and went away. And Jesus looked at, looked at that woman as she probably lay face down in shame on the ground. He says, woman, where are thine accusers? I don't know, Lord. He said, listen, go and sin no more. You know what that's called? That's called mercy is what that's called. And the God's mercy is God's goodness confronting human suffering and guilt. Listen, when the mercy of God confronts the suffering of men, listen, forgiveness takes place and misery ceases. Bartimaeus, instantly blind, instantly healed. The leper, instantly healed. Let me give you the couple, we got to stop here. To, here's number five. To receive mercy, we must believe that God is merciful. To receive mercy, we've got to believe that God is a merciful God. Quickly turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 116. Turn to Psalm 116 and verse 5, quickly. Psalm 116 and verse number 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. It's who he is. It's what he does. Mercy did, 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 wasn't created. It didn't just come into existence. Because God has no beginning nor ending. Mercy has always been. God never runs empty on it when all of us, listen, if all of us tonight fell on our knees right now and cried out, oh God, have mercy, God could extend it and the needle would never move. Why? Because it's everlasting. It endureth to all generations. So to receive mercy, we must believe that God is merciful. Sometimes God's mercy is extended without a plea. We saw that with Lot. But much of his mercy is exercised toward those who believe that he is a merciful God. You don't think David believed that God was a merciful God when he called on him and said, Oh God, have mercy on me. You know why? He had seen it before. He knew God was a merciful God. Listen, we must believe that it is boundless and available. Abraham believed and received. David believed and received. Peter believed and received. Paul believed and received. And I'm here to tell all of us in this class today, listen, mercy comes from a merciful God. And he can extend that mercy, but we have to receive it. 
and believe that he is a God of all mercy. And then let me hit the last thing and we're done. God will always deal in justice when his mercy is despised. He will always deal in justice when his mercy is despised. Here's my illustration of that. Go back and look at the history of Israel. God extended mercy to them over and over. He sent prophets to preach to them to try to get their hearts turned back to God. He sent prophets to preach to them and say, listen, if you don't turn, the, the enemy is going to come. They're going to move in. They're going to take over. They're going to destroy the temple on and on and on. He sent his prophets to warn them. But the history of Israel was a history in which they despised the mercy of God and God dealt with them justly because he allowed them to go into captivity. He allowed the enemy to come and infiltrate their land and take away their riches. You see, God is always going to deal in justice when his mercy is despised. So let's review here what mercy is. Mercy we see in the Bible in two facets. Number one, God withholding judgment upon us, although it's deserved. And number two, God displays mercy in the form of healing and comfort to the suffering. You'll see those two aspects of the mercy of God over and over and over and over again in the Bible. You see, again, mercy can be characterized as God's compassion on those in distress. And boy, do we live in distressing times. You know what America needs today? Mercy. That's what we need. Thank you for being here this evening. Father, bless the time that we have as we move into the worship service. Thank you. We've enjoyed the study of God's word. We pray that it would resonate in our hearts. And Lord, we would always, always remember how merciful that you are in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.